Good afternoon, everyone from a sunny um, sunny November Oxford. Um, my name is David Mills, and um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to yet another of our um, Centre for Global Higher Education webinars. Um, this afternoon um, in Oxford, wherever you are in the world, um, we, we are listening to Ying Yang um, from the University of Manchester, who is going to be talking about some really interesting doctoral research that she's completing on the role of education agents in the marketized international higher education sector. And um, this is a, you know, a really topic and an important topic to, to be discussing. So before we get started, a couple of quick slides as normal. Um, we are um, we have a few bit of housekeeping. So first of all, um, as you know, we always post um, these recordings. So we record each one and post them on our events page um, as soon as we can um, after the webinar. So there's a great archive for you there to look at. Um, and going back um, almost 400 webinars. Um, and then we also pu publish a transcript of the chat function. So during the webinar, please keep your video um, um, off and muted until at the end you can ask questions in the chat and then I'll invite you to unmute and come and ask your questions to Ying Yang um, during the conversation. Um, and the, there is a speaker function so you can see the slides really clearly. Thanks very much, and um, over to you, Yang Yang. The, the screen's yours. Um, thank, thanks, David. Um, yeah, let me share my screen now. Okay. Um, hello, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's section. And today is Thanksgiving Day. Happy Thanksgiving. And um, today what I'm going to talk is about my uh, part of my PhD research findings um, around um, the role of education agents in the marketized international higher education sector. I will focus, is, I will focus on uh, three themes, the most value services that education agents provide and um, the germ of uncertainty in agent user students um, um, university applications, as well as um, students' reflexivity in their position takings. Before detailing them, uh, let me introduce some background information. First of all, education agents. Um, in this study, I use BULA's 2021's um, definition. They are a person or organization that recruits international students and refers them to education providers. They are not employed by um, overseas education providers, but are private entities contracting to deliver a range of services to potential uh, students and provider. To a student, these services would ordinarily um, include um, education counseling, such as course and institution matching, and assistance with academic and visa applications. To a provider, Services usually include marketing and promotion services and support in identifying qualified students. Education agents are widely used by both English speaking and non English speaking host countries and prospective international students. Um, in the UK, for example, um, and as this table indicates, most universities work with education agents. Um, either through um, direct or indirect partnerships. It's estimated around um, 45 to 55% of international students were recruited um, through education agents. Uh, yeah. According to a local market report in China in 2018, around 74% of Chinese international students use education agents to apply for overseas programs. And let's look at the economic impact that agent generated. I don't have time to explain this calculation formula, so let's get, go to the result um, by BULA 2021. Education agents contribute approximately around 12 billion pounds to the UK economy each year. It's worth noting, um, universities pay commission to agents on the basis of a student's first year tuition fee, 
typically ranging between 10% and 15%. And last weekend, the Guardian reported that London University paid an average of around um, 8,235 8, pounds in agent fees per student. So it's very obvious that educational agents have emerged as a kind of uh, um, important role in international student recruitment, which can't be disregarded in the debates on international higher education and international student mobility. Okay, let's move to my project. And um, this project was grounded in my empirical knowledge of a triad of roles in the past including an um, education agent consultant, an um, international students who pursue MA education in the UK, as well as students based administrator at MA University in China. Um, I work um, for the industry uh, right after my undergraduate studies for around five years. During that period, I gained access to different stories and different consumers from various social classes in China which really stimulate my thinking about students' choice making, the potential impact of families, financial capabilities, their aspirations, and so forth. And around the fourth year, I, I, feel, I feel very guilty actually about lacking the real international learning experiences. So around the end of the fourth, uh, fifth year, I quit the job and came to Manchester for MA education. Um, I, I chose Manchester particularly, that is because most of my um, prior consumers chose Manchester. So I really want to explore the uniqueness of the Manchester University, University of Manchester by throwing myself into the real field. And my master's, um, around the end of my master's uh, uh, program, and uh, my supervisor, Dr. Suva Loma, strongly suggests me going ahead with the um, agents topic because my master dissertation around the role of agents, um, um, Chinese undergraduates' motivations to study PG UK postgraduate taught programs. And to them, I had one year gap for my PhD. Um, during the gap year, I work as student affairs administrator in, at an AD university in China, because I really want to understand what happened in China's system, what factors push a student to go abroad. And these empirical experiences inspire me to think about the potential choices of methodologies, research questions, and how to progress this project. Okay, this project actually has three overarching research questions. First of all, um, what were education agent services to Chinese agent user students? In other words, what services did Chinese agent user students actually receive? And to what extent and in what ways were Chinese agent user students affected by education agents in their application to overseas um, programs? And what did Chinese agent user students' application experiences imply for the international higher education sector? Um, yeah, this project was divided into two studies. And study one, study one focuses on the perspective of Chinese uh, of agent use um, agent education agent consultants. I conducted one of semi-structured interviews with 16 aging consultants across different cities in China in May 2020. Building on this work, I designed a study associated with Chinese aging user students' voices regarding their application experiences for overseas programs in uncertain time. Um, there were four rounds interviews from November 2020 to July 2021. In the following year, member tracking was undertaken uh, from May to July 2022. In order to mitigate um, the influence of tacit knowledge of my prior roles, I used interpretive phenomenological analysis approach to design the study. IPA highlights three levels of experience interpretation. They are what agent user students 
university application experiences are, how those students interpret their own experiences, as well as how I, as a researcher, interpret how the uh, students interpret their own experiences. Um, today, I'd like to discuss these three themes. Um, first of all, um, most value services. Um, among the range of the services education agents provide, these projects demonstrate evaluating transcripts, selecting potential programs, and producing application documents are most valued by agent user students in China. As for uh, evaluating transcripts, um, all the participants share the views that GPAs and first degree awarding universities play a significant role in admission assessment by overseas universities, particularly UK PGT programs. They expected agents to provide critical comments on their profile through honest evaluation of their university background subjects, overall GPAs and individual course grades. In this project, several participants prepare their applications very early and uh, okay. um, in the initial year of their undergraduate program and uh, kept in touch with the agents over time by sending them their latest um, transcript around the end of each semester. This allowed participants to inquire about the possible um, programs, the program choice and um, address their strategies in regard to maintaining a high GPA or retaking courses beneficial to their future plan. Participants also highlighted confusion around their understanding of fuzzy admission requirements overseas. For example, GPA entry requirements vary from university to university, and they found it difficult to navigate such information on university websites. Alongside evaluating students' transcripts, selecting and or advising programs was an indispensable part of their discussion with agents. Even prior to signing a, a service contract, I categorize participants' reflection about agents' contribution to the university and program selection process in three ways. Um, versus agent as alternative labor to glean effective um, information about admission requirements, universities, and programs, which really resonate with uh, the findings of a study around Chinese elite student study abroad choices projects conducted by uh, Dr. Ye Liu and uh, Wen Qingsheng. And the second is around agents as a signpost to navigate large amount of information and identify pertinent areas to focus on, as well as using agent as a form of insurance for being a subject to an overseas program. The ability to outsource the labor of producing application documents, such as personal statement, and CVs, reference letters, um, transcripts and certificates of internships was often given as key reason, reason um, for using an education agents. Often this is because um, these students were uncertain of their ability to develop these documents properly in English by themselves. And they feel such work was time consuming. Um, by contrast, high performing students, um, participants um, from top uh, 50, uh, 50 ranked university in China feel confident in their ability, but prefer to ask an expert to do so because they perceive these documents to play a minor role, minor yet time consuming role in the application process. It's worth asking, how do aging user students evaluate the, doc the quality of the documents education agent produce? This project suggests that participants try to evaluate the quality, but lack the insider knowledge to do so accurately. So actually they tend to be a kind of result-driven evaluator. 
ju make the judgment around um, the quality after receiving the application result. In other words, they can't make uh, evaluate those documents effectively before submission. Then what can we learn from this? And what do these imply? Um, these projects um, demonstrate issues of information asymmetry and information absence are the crust of the matter between the UK universities, Chinese international students, and education agents in terms of international student application and recruitment. In Bourdieu's term, the practice of the primary actors in this field are similar to their playing games through the mechanism of uncertainties. The projects address the very, and two students, two Chinese students, the very first question is, what do they need to know? As the number of the students studying abroad grows up sharply, the information associated with um, applications for overseas programs spreads in multiple forums and locations, particularly during COVID-19 pandemic. Then where to glean reliable and effective information becomes an important question. At the same time, confronted with immensely various co application at competition, the question of how Chinese students interpret the relevant information and position themselves take place. To many students, uncertainties are unconsciously and consciously interwoven in their choice-making process. In students' eyes, as aforementioned, UK University didn't describe their products, their programs properly, clearly, which I argue UK universities are similarly conditioning uncertainties in international student ad admission process. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic generated c c uh, serious uncertainties and challenges um, such as in, um, English language test, uh, visa applications, which causing, uh, cause more uncertainties. At this point, as study one focusing on agents' perspective um, suggests, education agents employed a four-step information management approach. They are finding information and confirming information, selecting information, as well as communicating information. In this way, um, agents work to mitigate information asymmetry as much as possible, as well as comforting um, agent user students. So uncertainties actually typify the very nature of international students' application and recruitment. Education agents seemingly effectively function as information broker, um, prompting certainties. I think it's still worth asking, further asking, what lies underneath such pre-existing uncertainty and the certainties that education agents generate. How do education agents understand what UK universities value? in terms of um, applicants um, qualifications and experiences. Given the first, given that the first degree um, university uh, can be, can be changed, how do agent, education agents ensure the advice around um, extracurricular activity, programs or projects uh, or such um, soft competence building activities will be helpful in students' application competitions and will be um, valued by potential programs abroad. Um, these projects address that education agents actually um, play as a pioneer, constantly exploit possibilities in applications and admissions which, however, um, is uncertain. It's actually in terms of advice on extracurricular activities. Yeah. 
they are uncertain about around these kind of things. Yes, they are uncertain and I'm uncer I'm clear and I'm certain whether these activities will be recognized by UK universities until they accumulate a certain number of application results. So in other words, they use a student's application as a kind of a test, testing out the potential value in those um, activities, in those uh, supplementary documents. Um, and simultaneously, cutthroat horizontal and vertical competitions amount um, between agents condition their disposition to prioritize their business ambition over Chinese agent user students' long-term interest, which breeds uncertainties in international students' applications and requirements. From the perspective of, of education agents, the low threshold for entering um, the industry um, drive the cutthroat competitions within that industry. For the purpose of gaining more service agreements, many agents overpromise the application results that students are able to achieve, which push those who intend to consider applicants' best interests into dynamic. And Consequently, education agents feel that Chinese agent user students tend to hold high expectation or overestimate their potential admissibility into certain programs in the face of consultation. Um, they were pushed to, um, agents were pushed to tease out high rank universities. Otherwise, um, some students didn't sign agreement with them. Um, and choose some other agents who can fulfill their expectation in the very beginning. Um, therefore, it's conceivable many agent, education agents are placed in a position of having to exaggerate applicants' qualifications, encourage applicants to select straight programs at high rank uni um, universities, and so on. Um, because today I don't have time, so um, straight programs, it's, it's it's re um, refers to um, some causes have nothing to do with the students' interests, but easily boost their GPAs, get high GPAs. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, it's worth noting education agents in inadvertently homogenize themselves along with molding and patterning Chinese agent user applicants. Um, Agent user students tend to shop around between um, different education agents ahead of finalizing an agent um, or agency. In this process, um, applicants gain a sense of uh, which level of universities they possibly reach based on not only GPAs um, and their first word in university, but also the consistency in agents' collective advice on the potential programs and um, universities to apply for. It hints at high level of similarity in advice among agents, which means agents possibly, possibly employ similar reference or template to evaluate applicants' profiles rather than really analyzing individual comprehensively. And moreover, um, this project indicates the similarities in established routine procedure of application between agents. Um, in the face of these kind of high similarities between agents, presumably how to demonstrate agents' uniqueness should be their top concern, which entails uncertainties. So I argued, uh, Education agents themselves are analogous to embodiment of uncertainty in international students application and recruitment. Um, the last thing is about students reflexivity in their position taking. Why I shift attention to their reflexivity? Because the longitudinal study will demonstrate the student proactive 
um, behaviors in this process, which will demonstrate this kind of thing. Many students actually prepare the application for overseas programs early, proactively collect information in relation to studying abroad through different channels, carefully choose a, a, a good education agent or agency, actively negotiate with their agents about the potential programs to apply for, and take active part in every detail of the applications with their agent consultant. Many Chinese agent user students who apply for PGT programs are almost independent of their um, families in terms of choice making, which contradicts to uh, contradicts finding of the previous study that makes students pursue different levels of education together. Because these studies uh, focus on students who uh, apply for PGT program, so they are relatively mature, independent decision maker. And um, in most cases, students reflect that their parents feel uh, less sense of international higher education sector, international program or education. So they prepare, they, they actually are most merely responsible for budget preparation, financial preparation, this kind of work in terms of which university to go to, uh, which university to consider, which, uh, and the, specific, the advantages of taking particular programs or um, um, the future opportunities, they feel less dense around this kind of information. So they prefer um, to push their, student, uh, their children to reach out to experts or their peers or communities to have more reliable information and make decisions in the end um, um, independently. And to do this self characteristic of Chinese agent user students is indicative of the need for education agents in their application. And many Chinese students tend to approach education agents early in their undergraduate career. The tendency for early preparations for overseas applications is a com accompanied by developing their ability to reflect on the rules of the application competition and the desired um, position takings. Education agents intervention facilitate the development of Chinese agent user students personal power of reflexivity to call the scope um, for um, their choice making. Because some students failed uh, so constrained um, because um, as a board mentioned, the students have little sense of what kind of information they should approach and what are the possible progress to consider. Um, agents are a kind of effective role, found, um, particularly on these kind of aspects. So they really help students to effectively uh, reflect on what students most cared about. Um, how to make the choices. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Because of, I, I actually don't have much time, so I really, um, I have an, um, a working paper um, use displaying students' choice making process, uh, indicating the changes over time over this application process, which will demonstrate um, the reflexive, how students reflexively think about something at particular points of this choice making process. Okay, fine. Um, yeah, move to the end. Um, the future of research. Post PhD, I'm so interested in these three questions. How do universities reflect on the current admission policies of UK universities and the value of education agents in this recruitment campaign? Because of COVID-19, I cut off this part. Um, so later, I, I should um, go ahead with that. And the second is around um, underrepresentative group of students. Because before, when I work at the industry, I do find agents effectively help some students from disadvantaged background realize 
or recognize the potential opportunities of war. And through this kind of um, pathway uh, making really changes students' life. So I would like to spot more around these potential functioning of education agents. And the final is about who are education agents. Um, alongside the PhD journey, as students reflect more on the, uh, their choice making and the peers' comments and feedback, I, I was aware that more and more current international students engage in agents' business part-time and full-time while they are studying abroad which must demonstrate something interesting, like emergent dynamics of these kind of international student uh, mobility or recruitment. So I think it should be a very interesting topic to further explore. Yeah, so if you're interested in um, education agents, I highly suggest having a look at this book, um, Student Recruitment um, Agents in International Higher Education, a multi-stakeholder uh, pers um, perspectives on um, challenges and best practices, um, added by Petulia, Enzo, and Addy. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Yingyang. That's, um, th th that's, it's such an interesting topic and you're quite right to highlight that that Guardian article last week. And the, 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 the numbers are, are intriguing, aren't they? That, one university paid 28 million to agents and and um there are clearly are lots and lots of commercial agents but as you say there might be many students who are doing it in an informal way so there's actually many many more um agents than the 230 they mention i i mean we have got some good questions in the in the chat but can i ask can i start by asking one you know, why do you think universities want to make to build this uncertainty into the admissions process um, because because then th then that that enables this space for the brokers for the agents. You, you, couldn't you see an argument for them providing more clarity and or you know guidance or or or, or, or making making this this these services available directly? It, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting dilemma. I assume it's because they need to be seen to be um, as rigorous and objective as possible in their admissions processes. Thank you. I think it's a brilliant question. Actually, I kept thinking about it. Why mm -hmm. university come to clarify their admission requirements, this kind of thing? It's beneficial to students, to themselves as well. It's kind mm -hmm. of, a, yeah, release their burden. Um, but now I think it might be something related to um, perhaps use a marketing logic. Market logic may help us to make better sense around this kind of practices or intention. Um, I think um, um, first, universities may not be aware of these kind of uncertainties. Mm. They think they have already put requirements clearly. They don't really understand whether students can interpret it properly. Yeah. Yeah. So it means that in other words, student uh, universities um, have less knowledge of what their prospective students need yes. in the stage of application. Mm -hmm. And the second might be is around um, how to marketize themselves. Because mm -hmm. for universities now, driven by neoliberal uh, globalization, university, almost all the university want to recruit as many international students as possible. Mm -hmm. So for learn, it's a kind of internal competitions. Yeah. Yeah. So make things, make information too transparent or too clear, just like release their secret or potential rule in terms of recruiting students. And so I think uh, might be, it's my assumption. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think it needs more evidence uh, to show the potential reason and the real reason um, behind that. Yeah, I mean, interesting. A comparison in the UK would be interesting. Medical medical undergraduate degrees. There's an enormous number of people who provide guidance and training and support for students applying because it's very competitive, and each university has a different strategy. So, so there, there, there is, you know, it's not it's not simply international students. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's great. Thank you, Yang. So we've got lots of questions. Let's go straight to them. And um, first off, the mark um, with our question was um, Agun Nogoro. Do you want to come in? 
Thank you, David. I, I, I hope you can hear my voice. Thank you, Yin, Yin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yang, I would like to call it that way. Uh, first of all, my name is Agum. That's I, I, I hope that it's not too hard to pronounce, David. Agum. I'm from Indonesia and I am currently finishing my uh, doctoral study at the University of Bristol. And that's quite intriguing and interesting uh, presentation from Dr. Yang, apparently related to the, the role of uh, educational agents. Uh, I would like, if you don't mind, ask three questions, which I hope these questions, when I have your answers, could become my reflections on, on how, uh, like the differences between educational agents in Indonesia, where I come from, and those in China. Right, uh, my first question would be, um, Right, you know, in Indonesia, agents advertise their services through social media, seminars, news, campus to campus, and sometimes they, they conduct uh, IELTS or TOEFL IBT training programs for the students, and, and in the end they advertise, well, they marketize their, their services to the students. Like, my concern, like, my question could be, like, in the Chinese context, like, do do they, the, the agents, promote their services in similar ways, or or do they do something else differently? And then my second questions would be, uh, of course, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that these, these agents receive certain incentives, like 15%, as you mentioned earlier. Like, <clears throat> I was wondering, can all agents receive these incentives without prior agreement with the universities? Or they have to, in the beginning of everything, uh, make a deal with universities uh, before they actually send the students to those uh, campuses? And then my last question, like you, you also mentioned, like COVID nineteen pandemic has created influence to to some of these agents. And how did the COVID nineteen pandemic in, impact the businesses, especially those uh, in your country context? Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Dr. Yang. And thank you very much for your question. Um... For well, the first question about whether um, in China's market use um, similar marketing activities, this kind of thing to disseminate never, um, to expand their share, market share, this kind of thing. Yes, quite similar. In China, um, um, also, it also depends on the types of um, education agencies. So uh, primarily there are three types. One is um, enterprises, a big company, very big, large companies. They um, have different branches across different provinces or cities in China. And um, the second type is around, um, is a kind of uh, companies, relatively small company. Um, they have a team um, and focuses on local um, city markets or region. And the third is a solo trader. Um, just one person or two person, this kind of very small team and set up uh, in, the, in a small office, this kind of thing. And uh, they, they approach potential uh, universities or training schools in the local cities, um, try to disseminate uh, their unique services because um, um, in most cases, they like they, they they tend to show the successful application results, demonstrates their um, ability of developing high qualified um, application documents, which help students to achieve and um, to receive um, offers from AD universities. And the second question about the commission stuff, um, actually it's relating to the type of the. Um, education agents or agencies. Because some um, agents like uh, solo traders, they often as associate with large companies or enterprise and they um, forward the, their applications to those companies. And so those companies will pack those documents together with their own application cases and then deliver to the to the universities they co op, co work and collaborated with, and um, in this way, solo traders can also receive the commission from university. But you know, uh, uh, they are large company, just like a little man, a uh, middle man, they should tease out certain part, um, yeah, certain part of the commissions. 
So the commission should be re reduced compared to someone who directly, some, some agents directly could work with um, universities. And the, the, the third question, uh, I'm sorry, I've got it around the COVID-19 and, uh, and uh, what, what, what a specific question? Uh, around how COVID affected their business. Oh, COVID, um, their um, business activities actually moved to, um, online. So some of them, especially solo traders, they feel, um, at least based on the study one, um, agent consult, uh, one of the case um, um, reflect their uh, prior colleagues who set up their own team. They feel um, serious influence by COVID because, um, because the students prefer to find a kind of a big name in the market because they think it's reliable. They are able to resist these kind of uncertainties in market. But solo traders, they, they don't have enough, maybe insufficient power to resist um, these kind of uncertainties. So for the big companies, they are actually uh, work as usual, but everything moves online. They have more contacts, interactions with the students online. But in terms of the application to for universities, um, this number actually they didn't. Um, some of them reflected the number of their patients was not reduced, but students' decision to uh, really go to go abroad uh, was influenced because um, come ongoingly changed policies around the travel restrictions and universities format like a dual format um, um, lecture delivery these really influence students thinking about whether they need to pursue the programs in time yeah okay, okay i hope that answers some of your questions like the great questions and the more detail you give us Yingyang, the more the more fascinating it is in terms of this really interesting commercial sort of um, risk management that the, the agents and the students are doing. Let, let's go on because there's lots of great questions coming in. Yuen, do you want to come in and ask your question? Uh, hi, sorry, hi. I cannot open my camera because I'm <laughs> in the library. Sorry for that. And mm -hmm. thank you for uh, amazing speech. And so actually, I'm also the undergraduate student at UCL, and I also like uh, ask for the help for the agents to help me to apply for the university. So based on my personal experience, um, I was wondering that because you mentioned that before that the agent, uh, that the students' decision making are independent of their parents. I was wondering that parents might still make a huge influence on the on this process. Meanwhile, I, I also consider that. Uh, the agents also like recommend me some university that I choose because I, I'm an international student. I do not really know about their like UK system or something. So I feel like there's still some influence or some bias on that. So can you like explain more of that? Thank you. Thank you so much. That is a very, for me, it's a very important, interesting question. Um, that is why I clarified in, um, earlier um, my uh, research focus um, students pursue um, UK PGT programs. Um, several participants actually prepare their application early. So it means they have more time to think about um, the potential programs or to learn potential programs to learn UK universities. And I I really understand what you said about um, students maybe need um, parents. I, I should say yes, of course, um, but for the students, um, undergraduate, Chinese undergraduates uh, who prepare application early, maybe in um, at least my longitudinal um, study demonstrates in the very beginning, they still, they have uh, relatively close discussions, try to have close discussions with their parents around these kind of thinking or concerns. But as they get involved more in these kind of learning process, they feel their parents' no uh, knowledge was very limited. They started to get stronger and stronger in terms of particular choice thinking. 
and slam students try. So that is why one of the argument is about ages help them to develop their personal power of reflexivity in the potential position takings. Students can start it um, gradually reflexively think about these issues and concerns and um, started to be more proactive in approaching the potential journals to get more information to help them to think about what they need, what they most cared about, and address their strategies and make the decisions in the end. And most students still a kind of a frank driven choice. They find a choice themselves like that, but it does not take it for granted that, oh, students just, uh, were fascinated by ranking. They actually go through a very full considerations about why ranking so is should be the top concern. They think a lot about that rather than just follow the train of I need to think it, um and top rank is the best for value. Um yeah. Yeah. It's almost like there's a whole pedagogy here, isn't there, between the the agents and the students. Um yeah, I, I just just really interesting. David, David Law, please come in. Yeah, thank you very much, Ying Yang. This was a fascinating subject. Um, and uh, already there's been mention of the recent articles about uh, how much British universities are paying in, in agent commission. My question really, and, and it may be an unfair question to you, because I can see that primarily your research is around the relationship between the users, the individual users, of, of agents and the services they provide. But my question is really about institutional perception on all of this and whether you've had a chance to look at uh, how universities uh, w w would speak about their own use of agents. It's clear, I think, from what you've said and also from the questions in, in the chat, that agents are in a very amb ambiguous position because they're receiving money both from students and from institutions. And it's not clear that the uh, interests of, of, of the institutions and the students are exactly the same. Um, the students want to, to get into a good university by and large, uh, and they want to make the best of their qualifications. Ultimately, everyone has an interest in trying to make sure that students who are admitted for programmes succeed on those programmes. That's clearly in the interest of the applicant and in the interest of the institution. But sometimes these can, things can get a bit cloudy. So, so, so my question is about um, how do the institutions look at this? Have you had the chance to talk about institutions? For example, University of Manchester, uh, which has a very big Chinese student population. It would be an interesting place to start about how, how does the University of Manchester uh, ha ha conduct its relationships with, with, with the agents that are supplying students to it? Great questions. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your advice, suggestions, and questions. Um, sorry, I'm plans. My brain again lost. Um, your question is about how. Uh, so, can I say it again? Your final question is. Um, so, the question really is about the motivating questions. Uh, you know, the, the two sides are ultimately the contract is between the institution and, and the student, uh, uh, but the agent uh, performs a certain uh, set of services to both sides. Both sides find that useful. Both sides pay for those services, but it's not clear that this produces in every case, certainly not in every case, uh, real clarity about whether there is a good fit between the individual student and the program stroke institution. So it's about what are the motivations for universities? What, what, how well do they understand, uh, particularly in the Chinese context, um, what services uh, their agents are providing to the institution and whether they're doing this well? Uh, it's something that I've been involved in professionally for, for many, many years and something that I've found incredibly difficult as a professional manager to actually understand uh, because, of course, ultimately, uh, when you're managing student recruitment, what you're trying to do is to fill a certain number of places with a certain number of students. And sometimes there is a temptation, of course, uh, to, to be more concerned about numbers in terms of quantity rather than quality. 
Wow, thank you very much. Um, I got caviar room. Um, thank you. Um, I think the first is around application number. For example, you take the example, uh, Manchester, University of Manchester, as an example. Actually, um, the rank of University of Manchester is the most attractive part. Um, is I think it's well known, it's the most attractive part um, for uh, potential Chinese students. Um, it's a kind of uh, yeah, common knowledge among potential student applicants. And, um, but student, I, I actually kept thinking about that. They have, um, university had high rank while they need to rely on agents to, to recruit more students. They can do it themselves, just use their name in a mark, particular market. But um, something we need, we can't be ignored is about efficiency in international student recruitment. Um, the number of application, um, I think, uh, might be beyond our, our imagination. Um, they really need a kind of effective assistant to help them um, select or to screen um, large or numbered of applications. Agents did play this kind of role. Whether, whether they really, um, um, in most cases, agents really follow the admission requirements to, um, to submit um, the applications through their particular trial notice or something. Um, in, on this aspect, agents really help universities to select students and um, select students meet the basic or um, the requirements on the university. And so it helped them to, to improve some efficiency in um, screening um, large number of applications. And the second is, um, is about agent conduct are getting transparent. So for them, um, I it's my assumption because I didn't collect their voices. I think uh, universities are relatively believe agents may um, may deliver um, clear information to potential students. Um, but the question go back to the original question, like uh, uh, my the the answer to the David's question. I feel that universities have less knowledge about what students need. Because of this kind of information gap, you know, um, agents can play a role there. They, they, yes, they did deliver information uh, universities expel them to deliver. But for students, that is kind of less effective information. So agents have a room to produce their own information layer. You, you by using their databases, they accommodate a large number of application cases, which effectively reflect on what concrete examples universities expect. Because universities never release these kind of concrete um, applicants background information example. For, for students from different educational systems, they may not um, be able to understand what does that mean? What, what you really want? I think that is valuable, but maybe for on the university side, it's less valued because it's so common because they have less understanding of the, the domestic system. Hmm. Yeah, so I yeah. think on this aspect, agents did play a role to help students, to help universities to select students meet the, 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 the basic requirements. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it also creates a room for agents to play a role in producing and reproducing something on their own. Okay, so I mean, it, it, that's really helpful, Yang, and I think you're, you, what you're trying to get at is also the challenge is, is knowing exactly how many people are applying and then not getting the applications forwarded, for example, because that could be seen as an effective use of agents or it's a gatekeeping role. I mean, again, Getting hold of that sort of data would be hard, but really interesting. Uh, there's lots of questions, but I, I want to pull out a couple of people who have asked questions which I think are quite important. 
Um, so, Rabbi, um, you asked a question about um, malpractice, and Juliet, um, similarly, about um, conflicts of interest. Do you both want to ask your questions? Rabbi first? Yeah, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for that. That's, that was very interesting, uh, and thank you for all the work you have done. Y yeah, so the question is, um, I, I'm just uh, wondering, from uh, uh, whilst conducting the research, have you come across any uh, actual like rules and regulations that are being put in place either by um, um you know for example the uk government or the chinese uh, um, government to make sure that whoever is practicing practicing in this in this area um are qualified and also they kind of um, follow certain rules and regulations so that um, um so uh, so that the, the students or the institution are not um, are, are being um, um, being safe and um, uh, and not um, exposed to any malpractices. Great, thank you, Robbie. That's a great question. And Juliet Sweeney, would you like to ask as well because it's sort of linked slightly? Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm interested in uh, if there's a conflict of interest here, and particularly. Look, I'm, my particular uh, area of interest is graduate education, and I noticed that there's um, uh, in Canada there's a, a distinct concentration of international students in certain programs, and also I teach at a community college, and that's also the case there. So I would see one particular conflict of interest in that students are a are, are channel towards certain programs that may or may not be in their best interest. Absolutely great. Thank you. Do you want to answer those questions? Oh, uh, sure. Um, for the policies, honestly, in the beginning of my PhD projects, I do see, do want to um, have some like a policy analysis, this kind of thing. But interestingly, I found this is a big lab, um, research gap. Um, in other words, there's very little policies around that. So that is why agents is a kind of uh, it's a kind of great word. Um, they can do whatever they want at the moment. So very few official organizations really monitored their practices in the market. Um, it's actually in terms of education practices advice. No, not at all, at least in China. But in, in the UK, um, actually British Council um, set up a. A, a series of training courses, particularly for agents. They try to authorize agents something. Um, but um, and, and, yeah, but um, I've, I personally feel that um, um, these kind of training courses should build um, a better understanding of different uh, markets, um, which may be more helpful to um, um, train or to uh, monitor agents' practices in the local market. And and um, perhaps we just one, one follow up from there. Anne Marie Taylor, you, you asked about the perceptions in Canada of these agents being predatory. Um, do you want to ask that question as well? Thank you, David. No, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a question. It was just a really. It was a thank you for. Um, the for Dr. Yang that it was um we hear a lot about pr uh, predatory behavior in Canada with regards to international recruitment and to hear from the students' perspective about how they're making their decisions and how the the molding helped make a lot of sense through the applications that I see. So thank you. Brilliant. Yes. No. I think you've really given us a sort of real understanding of what it feels like um for the students and the agents. Um, Abasal Karasani, you you did have a question about effectiveness. Do you feel your question's been answered? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, your presentation, Wang. I'm Abbasad from Zurich University. I'm guest professor here, and I enjoy for your good presentation. I have a, a question, but uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is, uh, if uh, you know any recruitment in universities for academic members, for uh, staffs, for uh, students, uh, control and based on by AI. Hmm. And uh, AI, as you many of 
you may know, control and check all resume and CV by uh, quantitative indicator. Uh, what's your idea in future maybe quantitative indicators dominant for quality quality indicators do you measure the effectiveness of um, agents from this aspect mm -hmm. because agent only check by ai instruments for example education experience contingency status and any indicators when we recruit students we sir, we, we will see a eh, we want we didn't this uh, qualification of these uh, students and uh, in more time uh, education education system was failed Okay, so that's thank you very much, Abzal. So you're asking a great, a great final question about the future of recruitment and whether universities will use AI, whether agents will. Any any final thoughts, Yingyang, on that on that one? Oh, thank you. That is a brilliant question. Really helped me direct um, my research interest in the future. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, I I think of AI very likely play a role in um, international student recruitment and also the international student application. Um, but one thing I'd like to highlight, um, learning from my projects as student, apart from information, students also need mental help. Because for them, university application is a long journey, it's a process, long-term process. At different points, they need different assistance, uh, in not only information, but also like um, advice, um, encouragement, or listeners, just listen to their complaints or anything, um, like emotion release, um, a channel for uh, releasing their emotions or thinking, this kind of thing. I'm not sure whether AI can do that to play that kind of role in the very near future. But um, if in the future, our technology becomes stronger that way, perhaps, yes, maybe this industry will be replaced by these kind of um, technologies. And also, I want to highlight as application, um, application number goes up sharply, universities become more selective. Actually, they are exactly using a kind of quantitative method to evaluate students. So that is one of my working papers around hierarchization of students, hierarch um, perspective international students in access to international student mobility, um, which shows that universities, um, in order to fulfill their efficiency, they study to quantitatively evaluate their potential students. Do you think it's fair for students? If AI just play this kind of role, do you think it will be, it's a good thing for our system, for the international higher education sector? Thank yeah. you so much. Yes, okay, I mean, you, you, that's, a, that's a great way to end, Ying Yang. You've, um, the, the metricization of applications is, um, is clearly going to change how we think about the missions as well. Um, thank you all very much for, for some great questions in the chat. Do follow up with Ying Yang if you, if you would like, and I couldn't ask, ask everyone to come forward, I'm sorry about that. We're gonna have to wrap up now. Um, please come back on Tuesday. We have a, a session um, on graduate job quality in the UK. Is there a need to look beyond earnings and occupation type? And that's with the statistical research from HESA. So that'll be very quantitative, but also really interesting. Um, please, please keep coming to our webinars and you do use the website to find previous events. Thank you all. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.